Welcome to our Remembering Vietnam 50 Years Later commemoration. On this occasion, we recall the sacrifices of the 2.7 million Americans who served in uniform during the Vietnam War, the 153,303 who were wounded during the conflict, the 58,318 who never came home, and the 1,589 who are still missing. This year's focus is on the year 1969. In June of 1969, the last episode of Star Trek aired on NBC. Jimi Hendrix appeared at the largest rock concert to date in Northridge, California. The Stonewall riots took place in Greenwich, New York. And NASA announced that Apollo 11 was clear to launch to the moon the following month. Meanwhile, on the other side of the globe, and perhaps far less known to the American public, the Vietnam War was midway through its second bloodiest year. By the summer of 1969, there were over 549,000 U.S. troops in country. By the end of the year, 11,616 American troops would die. That was 20% of the Vietnam War's total. And at least 20,000 would be wounded in the Shaw and Da Krong valleys and along the DMZ. On June 3rd, 1969, then Lieutenant David W. Callard, who was serving in Vietnam with two of his brothers, departed landing zone Gator by helicopter on a mission to assist a downed light observation helicopter, more commonly known as a loach, and its crew. Immediately upon landing near the crash site, near the Tra Bong Road, which is near the base of the Ammonite Mountains in South Vietnam, Lieutenant Taylor's party began taking automatic weapons fire. Unbeknownst to the men involved and to U.S. intelligence, the group had landed perilously close to an NVA headquarters. During the close quarter fighting, Lieutenant Taylor was hit repeatedly with AK-47 rounds, which tore through his left side and his lower right leg. The timely arrival of a medevac chopper saved Lieutenant Taylor's life, but many of his comrades had been killed that day. David appeared, excuse me, David experienced four and a half months of combat in Vietnam as a platoon leader with the 5th Battalion, 46th Infantry Regiment, 198th Light Infantry Brigade of the Americal Division. After the war, David spent 22 years in the Army Reserve in special operations and counterterrorism and would achieve the rank of Colonel. Colonel Taylor retired from the military in 1993. By then, he was Airborne Ranger and Special Forces qualified. His slew of awards and decorations would include a Silver Star for Valor, a Legion of Merit, two Purple Hearts, the Defense Meritorious Service Medal, two Army Meritorious Service Medals, the Army Commendation Medal, the Joint Services Achievement Medal, the Combat Infantry Badge, the Special Forces and Rangers tabs, and his Airborne Wings. Colonel Taylor has served as National Commander of the American Division's Veterans Association, and he is also a noted military historian. In 2011, after extensive research involving over 23,000 pages of declassified daily staff journals and officer duty logs, as well as interviews with over 100 fellow combat veterans, Colonel Taylor produced his monumental history of the 5th Battalion 46th Infantry and its three and a half years of service in Vietnam. That is the product. Best-selling author Chuck Carlick, who is the uh, co-writer of Rattlers and Firebirds, Combat Action with an Assault Helicopters Company in Vietnam, observes, quote, David Taylor in Our War has done the unimaginable, covering the entire history of a battalion in the Vietnam War at the grassroots level, not with excerpts from field reports, by but by reliving its history day by day with the soldiers who fought in it. It is the most detailed book about the Vietnam War that I've read, and I've read a barnful, quote, or unquote. John Roos, who is a former editor of the Armed Forces Journal, declared our war to be, quote, an unparalleled tribute to the tremendous sacrifices and toll exacted by one combat battalion in the Vietnam War. His work details how scores of Purple Hearts were earned, sometimes as a result of leadership shortcomings, often in tandem with tremendous acts of heroism. The book is a stellar tribute to an infantry battalion at war and its unique record of service, unquote. Perhaps the ultimate tribute has come from Pulitzer Prize-winning author of The Things We Carry, Tim O'Brien, 
who served in the same unit as Colonel Taylor. He proclaims, quote, our war is a comprehensive and superbly researched tribute to all we endured as members of the 5th of the 46th Infantry Battalion. After his talk, copies of Colonel Taylor's books will be available for purchase and for significantly less than the retail price. So I encourage you to remain after the talk is over and acquire a copy, which Colonel Taylor has generously offered to sign. And I'd also like to circulate a roster, if you could indicate who you are and what has brought you here in terms of your status, if you're a community member, student, et cetera. And without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, it's with the greatest pleasure and honor that I now turn things over to the patriot, hero, and author, Colonel David W. Taylor. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Students, pay attention because you may have a quick quiz on this and I want you to get an A. There's the old story about a private in the infantry who fought in the Pacific Theater in World War II. And when he returned home, he was asked by a local woman's club to give a talk about the Grand War in the Pacific. His response was, lady, I only knew the war as it looked from my foxhole. Well, today I'd like to go a little broader than a foxhole and give you the experiences of the infantry battalion that I served with in their three years and three months of combat in the Vietnam War. I want to take you on this journey because a number of historians who have read my book have told me that our experiences were a microcosm of the war itself. I spent more than a decade documenting the experiences of my battalion, the 5th of the 46th Infantry Battalion, 198th Light Infantry Brigade of the AmeriCal Division, which fought in Vietnam from March 1968 until early May 1971. The battalion fought in three of the four types of terrain that were encountered in the war, the coastal lowlands, the Piedmont, and the mountains. Now this excludes the Mekong Delta, which was south of Saigon, the large Mekong Delta, which only had one American division there during the war, because number one, that's all that was needed to counter the threat, and number two, the logistical burden was quite high to support somebody with all that water there. So we're going to talk about here are the mountains. This happens to be our area of operation for my battalion. Before we got into Vietnam, there was a South Korean Marine Brigade, the Tiger Brigade. The brigade has three battalions. They had this same area. And when we came there, they went further north to help the Marines because the Marines were really under a lot of pressure with all the North Vietnamese communists coming down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And so they went up there as, as a Marine. So we ended up covering the same area, one battalion, the three battalions covered before us. <coughs> So here you have the Annamite Mountains, uh, you can't see here, but these are rolling hills, this is the Piedmont, we'll talk more about that, and then the coastal lowlands. <clears throat> to begin with, a quick reference of where we were would be helpful to place into context what we experienced. As you know, uh, Vietnam was composed of 44 provinces very analogous to the states that we have in the United States, and the special district around Saigon, which is analogous to Washington, D.C. The American military divided the country into core boundaries. A core consists of two or more divisions. The assignments began with the first core up north, right up here, that's where we were at, and you can see that dark red line here, another one down here, that separates the core boundaries. So the first Five provinces are up here. Here's North Vietnam, the communists, Laos, Cambodia. A corps consists of two or more divisions, and the assignments began with the first corps up north, which I just showed you, composed of five provinces. 
beginning with Quang Nai in the south, right down here, that's where we happen to be. And then moving north to Quang Tin, Quang Nam, Chua Tien, and Quang Tri, which bordered the, mil the military zone with North Vietnam. Quang Nai, where we were, was one of the most hostile provinces in the war, accounting for 6% of all American combat deaths. Out of 44 provinces, our one province had 6% of all deaths. And especially along the coastal plain, with the scourge of mines, uh, was very, very tough on us. It's also worth noting that in that war, the Vietnam War, only 10 out of the 44 provinces accounted for 50% of all casualties. 50% of all casualties came from 10 provinces, and five of those 10 provinces were right up here where we were, the first core area. And the terrain that we faced was just as challenging as the enemy. The political structure of South Vietnam is also important to understand the context of the war. Within each province were district towns, Quang Nai province, where I served uh, most of the time, had three district towns, Binh San, Son Tin, and Duc Pho. We have a Duc Pho veteran here. Within each town were political villages. These were not physical locations, but political divisions of hamlets. So if a Vietnam vet is telling you about his experience, it's, well, we entered into this bill or village to do this and that, the other. what he's really talking about is the the sub-hamlet, which we'll get about into in a minute here. That was a, a smaller grouping of uh, homes and everything. The village was just a political designation for all these sub-hamlets. Now let's go further. Bin San District, right here, where our battalion spent a lot of time, was divided into several, several village, political village structures. And I'm gonna take one here, San Mai, because that gets us to the My Lai's, and you all heard about the My Lai thing, so we, I wanted to give that as an example. Within the political division of the San Mai village, there were three hamlet groups, the My Lai's, the Mai Kays, and the Ko Lois. Within each hamlet designation were the actual sites where the people lived. Those were known as sub-hamlets. And so in the case of the My Lai's, uh, there were eight sub, uh, six sub-hamlets, Mili 1, 2, all the way down to 6. So these were groupings where people actually lived. The sub-hamlet of Mili 4 is where most of the uh, killing took place in the Mili massacre. Each sub-hamlet varied in size, usually about 7 to 14 dwellings, and the sub-hamlet was separated by about one-eighth to one-quarter of a mile from another sub-hamlet. So in this case, the Mi Lai's uh, covered, all of them together, covered about six square miles. It's at the sub-hamlet level where the basic structure of Vietnamese society was to be found. Many Vietnamese never strayed further than five miles from their sub-hamlet their entire life. Ancestral worship was key in sub-hamlet life to worship those in the family that went before them, and to keep the land as it had been kept for centuries. The sub-hamlet usually was composed of the thatched dwellings used for homes, you can see there, small vegetable gardens around the dwellings, and then further out, the vast rice paddies which would provide the staple of their diet and the opportunity to sell some rice within the district to purchase clothes, tools, and so forth. So here you have, uh, here's a dwelling, there's another, we call them Thatchuches, okay? I went back twice to Vietnam, 1997 and then 2003, and the difference was day and night. Very difficult to find these types of dwellings in 2003, because a lot of the old line communists were dying off, so capitalism was starting to come in. They still maintain, it's still a socialist country, but, uh, Capitalism came in, and within these district towns, they have small cottage industries that make brick. It's not the type of brick that we have in the United States. But they started upgrading all their homes. And so here are the homes then, 
and then here are the vegetable gardens, and then further out here, here are all the rice paddies. That's the sub-hamlet in Vietnam. And the sub-hamlet uh, life was basic to the Vietnamese society, and it was this fact that was largely ignored in the war as the South Vietnamese and American military moved people from these areas that they could not protect into refugee camps and other what they would call strategic hamlets. Those villagers caught in that condition constantly tried to return to those sub-hamlets, the area of their birth. We'll get into this over and over again about pacification. The deal was get some Vietnamese militia to be in those sub-hamlets with maybe a squad of Americans and protect them and not move them into these refugee camps because as soon as they could, they'd get back to the area of their birth. And we just didn't understand that or cared to understand it. Let's talk some more about the terrain. The Adamant Mountain Chain ran the length of South Vietnam from the demilitarized zone with North Vietnam south to within 40 miles of Saigon. The mountains have high peaks, some more than 8,000 feet high, that straddle the country's borders with Laos and Cambodia. The terrain is as thick as it is high, with double and triple canopy jungle, which made movement difficult and dangerous. The unforgiving mountains were home to tigers, clouded leopards, various types of venomous snakes, and the well camouflaged lairs of the North Vietnamese Army. So wherever you are in South Vietnam, the Annamite Mountains, if you go east to west, varied in, in distance from about 24 to 48 miles, just to give you an idea of that. The Piedmont. East of the mountains lay the Piedmont, characterized by low-lying hills and small valleys which are interspersed with tall elephant grass and thick stands of wooded areas. These, in turn, are interspersed with open fields dotted by small rice paddies. The Piedmont was a transition point for the enemy. The heavy vegetation offered a fast avenue of approach from the mountains that allowed the North Vietnamese and main force Viet Cong units to quickly assemble troop strength, troop strength and munitions <clears throat> to attack the populated areas for the South Vietnamese and American forces on the coast. Most often, these attacks were to interrupt the pacification efforts of the Vietnamese people. So wherever you go in, in uh, South Vietnam, generally speaking, the Piedmont was about 12 miles wide, east to west. <clears throat> east of the Piedmont lay the coastal lowlands, which made up much of the land containing Vietnamese population centers and the major rice growing areas. But what is pictured here is a Vietnamese refugee camp by the South China Sea on the infamous Batangan Peninsula, which was probably the most heavily mined area in the Vietnam War. The lowlands offer broad plains of rice paddies interrupted by thick hedgerows of vegetation. This type of terrain bred the threat of the typical gorilla, a farmer by day and a fighter at night. A member of an irregular Viet Cong guerrilla unit rarely strayed far from his or her ancestral home. Their firepower was not a major concern to us, but they made up for that with their familiarity with the terrain. And the knowledge of that land brought with it the scourge of mines and booby traps, from small toe popper mines to the use of mortar and artillery rounds and many undetonated 500-pound bombs dropped from American aircraft. They were all used to deadly effect. So where you go in South Vietnam, generally the coastal lowlands were anywhere for between 7 and 10 miles wide. And what you can see here is part of the South China Sea. Okay? I'm just teeing this up before we talk about operations. The vast majority of infantry battalions in the Vietnam War had base camps or landing zones, or what we call LZs, from which to operate. Each LZ had an artillery battery, three artillery guns, for the direct support of the soldiers in the field, 
as well as the LZ had uh, that battalion headquarters, its supply, maintenance, and administrative functions. The LZs provided a respite for the infantry companies on occasion to return to the field for a rest, showers, some hot meals, and cold beer. Of course, if they were back at the base camp, they were also used to guard it along its bunker line, which surrounded the camp. But that was not bad, a bad trade to catch some sleep during the day and remain vigilant at night when sappers could attack the bunker line. This was a fair exchange for not humping in the field with 60 to 70 pound rucksacks in 95 to 100 degree heat. Now what you see here is the eastern half of our base camp, landing zone gator, facing the coastal plains. On the small hill to the left, right up here, Here's the lowlands here, and out beyond that's the South China Sea. On that small hill, there's a 105 millimeter artillery battery of three guns to support us when we're operating in the field. Now for battalion commanders, the drawback to having base camps is that they require troops to defend them. In our case, one of our four infantry companies, each battalion has four infantry companies. One of those companies had to be retained at the base camp at all times for defense. And then included to that, those that worked at the base camp and supply, maintenance, and those things, they had to pull their load in the evening as well. They manned some of the bunkers in order to have some reasonable coverage. But battalion commanders lost some tactical opportunities to deploy these troops into the field because the base camps always had to be defended. What you see here is the western half of LZ Gator, which faced the Piedmont. Beyond the tall watchtower on the far side is part of the bunker line, which you can't see in the picture. The radar unit you see helped us to identify approaching enemy units at night. To the left side of the camera, off the camera, was the landing pad for helicopters to pick out, up our troops to take them on an air assault to whatever terrain held the promise of encountering the enemy. And a brief war story on that, whenever we go down there uh, to wait for the helicopters to take us up and you split your men up into what we call chalks. So each man knows you, this group, you go to the first helicopter, the second helicopter, and they approach the helicopter from two sides. You get on quick and off they go. And this was done quite frequently. What you didn't want to see when you're out there waiting for those birds to come in to go on the mission is if the chaplain shows up. But that happened once, and it's like, does he know something I don't know? <laughs> and so um, he's there to comfort you and everything else, but sometimes you, you had second thoughts. Most of the infantry battalion base camps in Vietnam were located in the mountains or the Piedmont. They were always subjected to a major attack by the enemy, but most often the most common threat were sappers, carefully trained North Vietnamese regulars who wore only shorts, to allow their bodies to feel the ground in front of them, and who would devote hours and hours in the night to slowly crawl through your defensive wires, your trip players, and your claymore mines that surrounded the cleared terrain beyond the bunker lines. Their goal was to get next to the bunkers with explosives, <coughs> blow the bunker, and rush inside the perimeter to destroy a predetermined target. Sometimes assault forces would crawl up behind the sapper and follow in to make a major attack. Our base camp was hit by sappers more than 10 times when we were in Vietnam. Most attacks had limited success. But one nighttime attack in early May 1969, I was there, uh, but I was in the hospital with malaria. That attack killed our battalion commander. Uh, so we were starting to get into pacification and part of that was to have civilians quote unquote, come onto your base camp to work there so we could give some money and, and, and to, for the local economy. And it was a bad deal because uh, at least half of them were communist agents. So they got to see where everything was. And they knew exactly where the battalion commander's bunker was. And it was a tough, tough night for us. Uh, this man was a African-American lieutenant colonel, one of the few at the time at that level. He had served in the Korean War as a company commander. He had a silver star from Korea. And uh, they went right to his bunker and killed him. 
even though he had some defensive people, those they were guards, they were killed as well. And that was in May, and in August of the same year, his son was in the Marines up north near Da Nang, and he was killed as well. So the wife, it was a terrible, terrible blow for that family for what they had to endure. I'm not going to gross you out too long with this picture, but you need to see this. Each time the enemy sappers who were killed in the attack on LZ Gator were thrown into the back of a small truck and taken to a nearby sub hamlet, which was always populated by communist agents. There they would be buried by their comrades. The message that we sent was very clear. We would not be intimidated. I want to show this to you because you can see just shorts, that's it. And sometimes, I mean, these men were carefully trained up in North Vietnam before they came down to Ho Chi. Sometimes they would even grease their bodies. And they were very, very deadly, very well-trained uh, enemy soldiers. Yes. What weapons were they carrying? Sometimes no weapons at all except a satchel charge. Usually it was a satchel charge. They'd get up through our wires, they cut our wires, and then they had to feel in the dark where our claymore mines and make sure that whoever was in the bunker didn't hear them. And then they'd disarm the claymore mine and anything else that was there. And when they got up to the satchel, they'd pull a cord, which was like a five second delay, and they'd throw the satchel right into the bunker kill everyone inside. Uh, one other thing on the bunker line story, uh, you saw the radar unit. I, when I first got to the battalion, they made me the mortar officer for our uh, company. And it was fine, like a nothing job. I think the company commander just wanted to feel me out, see how I was. But the mortars usually stay behind. So I would go up at night and be next to that radar unit and we would see small groupings, maybe four or five enemy moving around at night. And during the Vietnam War, if you moved at night, you were enemy. Everyone knew you don't move at night. If you're civilian, you stay in your hammock. And so then I would call in my mortars on, on the enemy. Uh, it was good practice to practice, you know, calling in fire, close fire, and so forth. And we did that one night, and then the next morning I was at uh, breakfast, and the, the battalion S5, who is the civil affairs uh, officer, he goes out to all these local hamlets in the area to make friends with them and help them out, support them if they need things, that kind of thing. Um, he said, Lieutenant Taylor, he said, were you, were you the one firing those mortars last night? I said, yeah. I said, I think we got a few and, and uh, the radar could show them splitting up and running. When he says, well, I just got a report that uh, one of the Vietnamese said that that round, we had uh, flare rounds that would come down, uh, hit his home and burn his home down. I said, baloney. I said a few other things, too. Uh, we knew where we were running those, okay? But what they do is they grab that at night and bring it back to their, their hooch, set the hooch on fire, and they get paid a lot of money for the uh, so part and parcel of the war. So back to the terrain. Together, those three distinct terrain environments that I talked about, the mountains, the Piedmont, and the uh, coastal lowlands, were a mixture of contrast and contradiction that would try the infantryman's soul. While the terrain was blessed with water of over 100 inches of rain annually, which watered the fertile rice fields, desert-like cacti existed near the swamps and the rice paddies. Temperatures on the coast or in the mountains and in the valleys of the Piedmont could soar to over 100 degrees. Yet the hilltops in the Piedmont or the mountains could be shrouded in cl clouds and rain, whipped by high winds, which drove temperatures to bone-chilling lows. The cold, driving monsoon rain could abruptly cause temperatures to plummet, and then after sunrise, rapidly change to zoring heat. These rapid temperature changes, the hedgerows, the elephant grass, which would cut a soldier's skin passing through it, just like razor blades, and we have a picture of this later on. The mountain peaks and the thick jungle strained the bodies of the infantrymen day in and day out. Lean, muscular bodies were daily racked with pain, skin rotting from fungus, and water immersion, along with the ever-present fatigue. The infantrymen trudged on, carrying 60 pounds or more of food, 
small creature comforts, and enough ammunition to hold your own against the enemy. And in the infantry, what you don't carry, you do without. Infantry operations vary based on the enemy situation, the terrain, and the availability of soldiers to meet a particular threat or take advantage of a particular tactical opportunity. <coughs> operations often overlap with each other, and infantry battalions were often directed to fight outside their own area of responsibility. And herein lies the nub. With no disrespect to World War II veterans, the average infantryman in Vietnam saw three times more combat than the average infantryman in World War II. Why? The helicopter. We could be picked up rapidly and inserted wherever the enemy could be found. In, in World War II, they had some heavy battles, but it was a movement of, by land, trucks and vehicles and that kind of thing. Operations often overlap with each other, and infantry battalions were often directed to fight outside their own area of responsibility, as I said. And when we got caught up, once I was in Rocket Valley, which was right here. LZ Gator is here, and Rocket Valley was right in here. Not a bad job. I had my platoon there. The enemy would come in and fire 122 millimeter rockets over here into the base camp. So my mission was to keep the rockets off the general's back. And Rocket Valley was kind of plush, not too, not too arduous duty, and as long as we were there, no rockets were fired, so I had no problem staying there the rest of the war. Uh, but what happens in Vietnam, all of a sudden you get a call and say, oh, where are your location, okay? All right, get your men together. We're picking you up. There's a unit that's in heavy contact out in the mountains. We're taking you out there. I didn't even have a map for the area. So you'll get a map when you get there. That was the nature of the war. So here you see our own area of responsibility all through here on the southern area of the division's base camp, down to the provincial capital of Quang Nai. So this is about 26 miles. That's a lot of territory to cover for one battalion. The inset up here shows a small portion of the area we were sent to Operation Burlington Trail, some 30 miles from our own home, home turf, deep into the mountains. The Burlington Trail mission was to wrest control of some provincial roads from the main force, North Vietnamese Army. We also fought in operations Wheeler and Wallowa, which were combined to destroy enemy forces in the Heptok and Quezon Valleys, again, far from our home turf. Other operations outside and within our own tactical area were Pocahontas Forest, Golden Fleece, Russell Beach, Geneva Park, and Nantucket Beach. Each are covered in my book, and they were unique as far as the objectives and the terrain and the enemy threat that the infantrymen encounter. To understand the Vietnam War at the tactical level, you have to understand these operations at the grass level. In each operation, the infantry battalions were nimbly cross-matched with artillery support, armored cavalry, and other support as soldiers traded one piece of terrain for another to defeat the enemy wherever it could be found. It was usually in the mountains or the Piedmont where the infantry encountered major enemy forces. My battalion made numerous air assaults into the mountains and found elaborate North Vietnamese Army base camps, complete with underground ovens, classrooms, stockades for prisoners, and elaborate sleeping quarters. And during our more than three years in combat, the battalion also discovered three enemy hospitals in the mountains, including operating rooms, post-triage bed wards, and numerous medical supplies. And the operating rooms are usually about three, two levels below ground. The enemy's medical staff always pulled out ahead of us, of our arrival, with their walking wounded and as much medical supplies as they could carry. Those enemy patients who could not walk crawled just to get beyond the hospital complex to hide and hope for survival to fight another day. What was left for us to find were dead and dying patients, some with arms and legs rotting off. And around the camps were freshly dug graves of patients who had succumbed to their wounds. 
the sure sign that the enemy suffered enormous casualties from American firepower. It was at one enemy hospital discovered during Operation Burlington Trail that our battalion's soldiers were most exposed to man's inhumanity to man. Two women were found barely alive and emaciated up in the hospital, weighing no more than 50 pounds each. At first, our soldiers believed them to be enemy nurses, perhaps stricken by malaria, because in that Ho Chi Minh Trail, not only men came down there, but a lot of uh, female nurses that were trained to support the soldiers. But when our interpreter arrived, they told their story of being captured in their hamlet in the valley below, taken up to the hospital, and used for blood transfusions to wounded soldiers just off the operating table. In barely audible voices, the women cried for vengeance and did not want to be separated from our men who were taking them down off the mountain to be airlifted by helicopter back to a hospital. They both survived. One, one of the medics that carried one of those women down off the mountain into the, uh, to the helicopter landing pad, she was clinging to him. She, he was her savior and would not let go. And we finally had to gently pry, pry her arms away to get her on the helicopter so she could go in. As the war moved on, the tactics began to change, especially after the Tet Offensive of 1968, from which the enemy never fully recovered as long as U.S. forces were in Vietnam. Battalion-sized search-and-destroy missions, that's what we start with in 65, 66, 67, the big battles, Yadrang Valley Battle, made famous by Mel Gibson's movie, which is a great movie, and uh, actually that was not the first big battle uh, the first big battle was just south of July in RAO in 65, uh, in Septem August and September, and that was Operation Starlight, where the Marines pinned the uh, 1st Viet Cong Regiment, two battalions of that regiment, up against the sea and just bludgeoned them. Uh, so battalion search and destroy missions continued, though, but then less frequently after Tet of 68. And search and destroy missions mer morphed into search and clear, clear and sweep, cordon and search type missions. Battalions rarely operated as a whole at that point in time, but more likely their rifle companies operated alone, even in the mountains. You wouldn't dare do that uh, in the 65, 67, and 68 time frame. The battalions operated together in the mountains, or uh, if it was one infantry company, they would have been slaughtered back then. But now, we would send just one company into the mountains. And after General Abrams took command in Vietnam from General Westmoreland, the focus changed to pacification, something, in my judgment, should have been in place from the very beginning. It was not unusual for rifle platoons to be operating alone by 1969, placing out squad-sized ambushes, and this is the war that I knew. On occasion, an infantry company would search and clear an area operating together, but only if intelligence suggested that there could be a large enemy force in the area. Otherwise, we were on our own. Infantry platoon has about fully staffed 45 men. Uh, I rarely took more than uh, 23 to the field. Welcome to war. These men can all testify to that. Uh, you lose a lot of people to illness and, and everything else, so... One of the tactics that we developed were hunter-killer teams, fully self-sufficient infantry squads, each possessing two M60 machine guns, a sniper rifle, and lots of ammunition to defend itself if attacked by a superior enemy force until reinforcements could arrive. The teams changed positions every two days but did not move far due to their heavy loads. When spotting at small enemy groups, they caught an artillery fire helicopter gunships, or if close enough, use their own weapons. These squad-sized hunter-killer teams of 10 to 12 men allowed several infantry platoons to keep watch over a much larger area to keep unrelenting pressure on the enemy. Sending a squad or an infantry platoon out by itself, as I mentioned, would have been unthinkable in the 1966 and 67 time frame when the enemy was quite strong. 
This is uh, the cover of my book. I love this picture. It's the first squad of Alpha Company of the, of the battalion. And uh, this is their hunter killer team. I love this picture. Look at their faces. Half of them didn't want to be there, but they were there and they're determined to do a job. Made these bunch of studs there, I'm telling you. <laughs> Great guys. I just look at their faces. They made the best of it and they were like brothers. That's what happens in war. One hunter killer team was discovered by a large force of NVA regulars, and the team quickly scampered into a large stand of six foot high elephant grass, where, as luck would have it, there was a depression in the ground that allowed the men to get below ground level. For more than 36 hours, that small team, like you see here, remained silent as more than 100 enemy soldiers probed their position with heavy fire. The enemy was reluctant to enter into the high grass without knowing exactly where the team had hidden. The team chose silence over annihilation. And on the third day, they slipped away. Eagle flights were also used to great effect. Three UE helicopters could carry an infantry platoon that would swiftly and efficiently search out suspected enemy positions. This use of aeromobility made it possible to search as many as 10 locations in a single day. So our intelligence came in and it said, okay, this sub hamlet over here, our contact there, said there's a Viet Cong tax collector there, or part of the infrastructure of the Viet Cong were there, and over here is this and this, and here they have a cache of weapons and da da da. So they, they tee it up, and that platoon would hit all those areas, uh, one right after the other. If they ran into Heavy fire, there was usually uh, a bunch of uh, people waiting to support it, to go right in. So that's how we did it. It became very, very effective. Our VIP program, which stands for Vietnamese Informant Program, had great success in the populated coastal areas. It was developed by the military intelligence folks and had two purposes. First, to get the peasants to bring in unexploded munitions they found to keep them from the enemy converting them into mines and booby traps, and in return, give the peasant an attractive payment. Some would bring in an unexploded 105 millimeter artillery round, a favorite device for enemy mine making. We paid the peasant about six American dollars in local currency, uh, a huge sum for them and a great deal for us. The other purpose for the VIP program was for our intelligent people to question the populace about enemy insurgents who were embedded in some of the hamlets. The alleged turn-in was a cover for some peasants who were informants to our intelligence people. The program worked well. And uh, so what, what to do is uh, you go into this hamlet and you have the South Vietnamese sitting there to communicate with the peasant. They would come in, they bring in all kinds of machine gun rounds, mortar rounds, everything else. But amongst them were our informants. So when they would come up, they would come up with something to turn in. And allegedly we're writing down what they gave us so we could decide what we're paying. And what's, what they're actually doing is telling us over in this hooch over here or here is so-and-so. Uh, that's an undercover person, Viet Cong, and that kind of thing. So immediately after we left, the Vietnamese would go right in there and go right to that person. Um, but wars are messy deals. So look at this. This is the one day LZ Dotty was a landing zone south of where we were, uh, just off the, uh, the Highway 1, and it was an artillery uh, post. But look at this. 1,200 machine gun rounds, uh, 51 M79 rounds. Those are the grenade launchers you pop up. Um, Seven hundred five millimeter artillery rounds. Good God. Um, M fourteen mines, uh, one law light anti tank weapon, and on and on and on. Over here in LZ Paradise, this was a Marine Cap team right on the South China Sea. They called it Paradise because if you go there, it truly was Paradise. So look out over the South China Sea. Vietnam, South Vietnam was a beautiful country. Uh, we didn't enjoy its beauty because. We were too busy trying to stay alive, but uh, this was a beautiful place, and the Marines 
collected uh, a booby trap, three artillery rounds, and on and on and on. Uh, four 81 millimeter mortar rounds, uh, two and a half pounds of TNT, and so forth and so on. So, for both purposes, uh, the program uh, was very, very effective. Yes? What do we say in the big box? We blew it. We take it uh, as far away from that area as we could. Not far. We just blow it in place. Uh, for for M16 ammunition things like that, we could never tell if they were just corroded or something like that, if, uh, or the grenades, and it was just too dangerous to use. Uh, it could blow up on ourselves. Sometimes, the, even we had some incidents. It's in the book where the the grenades they didn't check their soldiers didn't check their grenades, and it was starting to rust, and the damn grenade would just rust out and boom, blow up while they were carrying. Didn't happen very often. So for that reason, and we didn't know what condition the munitions were, we just blew them in place. And uh, so I, another quick war story, on LZ Gator, we had uh, a bunch of stuff that had to be blown on the, the base camp, and they told me, Lieutenant, go over there and uh, blow it up. Well, I'm infantry, so I'm not the brightest guy around. And so I go over there with a buddy, and instead of putting the... The, the, the stuff on the ground and then you put your dead cord and your TNT on top of it to blow it down into it. Dummy me, I put it underneath. So it blew it and oh, what a sense. I thought, okay, end of career. I'm going to get relieved and everything else. Nothing ever happened, but I got everyone's interest on, uh, on that day. Yes? One occasion where some kids from the local village must have had a grenade. Yeah, yeah, out on the Batanga Peninsula, we had LZ Minuteman, and we, we'd get all that refuge and put it in a, a large hole, and we told the kids, stay away from there, stay away, but kids being kids, sometimes when it once a kid was killed by uh, getting blown up. But, uh, and the other thing is, too, they, the, the kids would take these, the, the communists would take these, they put a rubber band, they'd pull the pin on the grenade, but hold the handle, then put a rubber band around it, and then they'd go into uh, a, like a district town where you had uh, military jeeps and that kind of thing when no one was looking. They'd stick it right down the uh, gas tank, down the tube into the gas tank. And of course the gas would dissolve that, that uh, rubber band and it would blow up. How did the enemy get hold of so much of this American made ordnance? Well, uh, we, we used it. <laughs> we was, used it so much that uh, it was just there. Every war is, is uh, there's a lot of refuge and Wars are messy, and so um, uh, we used a lot of uh, firepower over there. And sometimes the, uh, the aircraft dropping a 500-pound bomb, that bomb wouldn't go off. And they had Viet Cong and North Vietnamese carefully trained in North Vietnam. They'd come down the trail, go into these uh, hamlets, and their whole job was to get these things and take it back, and they'd unscrew the, the front of it and everything else, and they'd rig it into a... Uh, uh, a booby trap. And the artillery rounds were really preferred because the armored personnel carriers that you use, they were somewhat constricted to where they could go and only in open areas and the enemy knew that. So if they could figure out, okay, if the enemy's going to, Americans are going to come in with armored personnel carriers, they're going to have to come down here. So that's where they put those 105 howitzer rounds. And that could just blow up a, a armored personnel carrier. Yeah. I have a, just a couple more um, emails. That's not a student, Professor Miller said. <laughs> By mid-1970, for the most part, infantry companies ranged far and wide to cover a large amount of terrain. Infantry platoons were often within those companies and split up their forces at night for multiple ambushes. 
and even nighttime patrolling was pursued in the Piedmont and some coastal areas. And we were, West, uh, General Abrams, when he took over, he said, I want nighttime patrolling. And so Americans would be at night. People think only the communists worked at night. Well, we got into that 69 time frame and beyond. Americans were patrolling in the evening as well. So the enemy no longer had exclusive use of the night for movement. One tactic that had tremendous effect in the mountainous areas away from hammocks, and I want to emphasize that, well away from hammocks, was the mechanical ambush. These involved stringing a series of Claymore mines together off the side of a footpath believed to be used by the enemy. A wooden clothespin, you've all seen this, I'm speaking several generations ago, I don't know if you ever seen a wooden clothespin, okay? Where the pincers were, they had two thumbtacks, top and bottom, okay? And um, that was placed with a C-ration, so here's your pincer, you have two tin, and then a plastic C-ration thing, which you can get at fast food stores now, okay? It was placed inside here, and then on the end of the sea ration spoon was tired a wire, and that went across the trail. And then the, the detonating part went off this direction, wired into the claymores. So the enemy comes down the trail at night, trips the wire, pulls, pulls the spoon out, connection is made, and three or four claymore mines go off right on the trail. Uh, you didn't have to be there to do it, okay? Let's see. It was not uncommon for a live ambush to hear their mechanical ambush detonated in the still of the night. In a first flight, they would find dead enemy, discarded enemy equipment, or mangled flesh with blood trails leading away. So we got to the point in the war, up in the mountains, you never do that down in the valleys where the hammocks were. An infantry platoon would be in the mountains, you split your platoon in half, for a live ambush, and then each one of those live ambushes had to put out a mechanical ambush. So you got quite a quite a bit of coverage. And again, this is in the mountains, and the enemy got pretty fearful of our mechanical ambushes. And uh, they even started at one point uh, using flashlights to go down the trails. And of course, we could see the flashlights from the live ambush and then call an artillery. And so they were very, very effective. The downside, if the ambush was not triggered, you would have to go out the next morning and get it because you're moving someplace else. So you had to remember where you put your ambush. We had two incidents where our own men tripped on the ambush and, and were killed because they forgot where the wire was. Vietnamization of the war took on increased importance in the 1970-1971 time frame, something, as I've said before, in my opinion, which was begun too late. Infantry units increasingly worked directly or indirectly with Vietnamese army units or the regional or local force militias. It was in those militias that were in those sub-hamlets, but they had World War II weapons, heavy Thompson machine guns, carbines, okay, so we started to up on them uh, and, and get them ready. In our area, one infantry company of every battalion had to devote itself to training up the militias in the area who would be in charge of protecting designated refugee camps and hamlets. To accomplish this, the militias were finally given the arms they needed, American M16 rifles, M60 machine guns, and M79 grenade launchers. Their training was tedious and took time, but some of these militia units began to show great promise. Oh, if we would have started that back in 1966, 67, but we didn't. Now, one drawback was that some, the American infantry was also there to pick up the slack and something that caused some militia units to be less than ambitious in their training and performance. And it's in my book, and we had ways to deal with that, to get, to get them out, because uh, we weren't gonna be there forever. In the end, it was our battalion's experience, and I believe the experience of much of the war's effort, that the focus was directed too much on winning the war for the South Vietnamese, a la the complete victory we had achieved in Asia in World War II, and not giving enough attention and support 
to up on the South Vietnamese military early on with our weapons and with an emphasis of us fighting together with the South Vietnamese forces. In the final analysis, when in that kind of a situation like Vietnam, you can't win it for them. They have to win it for themselves. In addition, a greater emphasis should have been made by U.S. forces to be involved in pacification efforts early on that would have greatly denied support to the enemy in populated areas. The South Vietnamese peasant, I've read book after book about the culture of the South Vietnamese. Deep down inside, they really didn't care who was in charge in Saigon and whether the communists were in charge or the South Vietnamese government, what they really want deep in, in their culture and in their ethic is a chance to be left alone and go on with life, raise their children, and worship their ancestors. So whatever side of the equation could guarantee that peace to them, they would be devoted to them. And we could have done that had we done pacification a lot earlier. Now, pacification would certainly not have endeared our battalion commanders and others to that role, because reputations, therefore, could not be made as fighting commanders by searching and destroying and gaining large enemy body counts. But in fact, pacification was the formula needed to win the war. In the end, the American infantry, of which I was proud to be a part of, did everything that I was asked to do in Vietnam and much, much more. The military and political leadership should have upheld their end of the commitment as well. Because in the end, we returned home without glory, without a victory, and without sustaining our allies as we had promised. Okay, so that's it. And uh, how much time do we have, Dr. Brown? Uh, 20 minutes. Uh, just, I didn't come here to sell books, but I did come here to sell books, too. But, um, I want to get into questions and answers from the students. From the students, we'll get students. You guys can chime in if you, if you have some. Um, the book, Our War, it's in a third printing. It's done very well. It's 722 pages, so it's a tedious read. You're going to be in the grass with the, uh, the soldiers the whole time. Uh, when I finished the book, I come out of the, in addition to Army Reserve retirement, I came out of the corporate world, and so I created my own publishing company, not wait for another publisher to tell me to pare that down by half, and it's like, forget that. I got it as tight as I wanted. And so I started my own publishing company so I can decide what to charge for that. The barcode price on the Our War book, if you were to get it at a bookstore, is $32. Uh, I'm selling it for $15. And then next to that is a book, a friend of mine who was an artillery officer in, in our battalion. And uh, he's covered in the book. He, he saw a lot of heavy stuff where he caught in a lot of artillery fire close in to his unit. And he saw a lot of action and everything else. So after he was done his six months of field duty, the division headquarters found out that this guy had a degree in sociology. And so they brought him up to the division headquarters and they said, your job is going to be to brief every soldier that comes into this division about the necessity to respect the Vietnamese people, their culture, understand what drives them, and the whole thing. And this is juxtaposed over six months of killing a lot of Vietnamese people, you know, communists most of the time. So it was kind of a, a contrast there, and, and he tells how he dealt with that in addition to his field duty. So that book is 1495. Uh, I'm, if you want that book, it's five bucks. It's not about making money anymore, it's about getting the word out. So five bucks for the one, 15 for the other. Comments from the students, questions, all the way in the back. So like in your closing sentence, you said something about you didn't win, we, America didn't win the war? Yeah, that's, my, in terms of the totality, we didn't win the war, okay? Right. We never lost a, a, a major battle militarily. And it's kind of interesting, I think God put this kid in my place, uh, my um, legion post in, in Medina, Ohio, where I'm from, uh, we have school kids come in every once in a while. And there was one group of kids, it's a special school we have for troubled kids, and it's from grade school all the way up through high school. And they had a great time, I had veterans there to talk to them and, and, and that kind of thing. And uh, somebody, somebody asked, well, did you win the war? Uh, just like you're asking, and I said, 
Well, not quite, and I was trying to parse for, for words and everything. And this little kid in grade school, he, he says, did you ever lose a battle? I says, no. Says, well, then you won the war. Right, right. That's what I was getting at, because I'm there. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> so that was like out of the mouth of a little kid. Okay? <laughs> Other questions, comments from the students? Yes, sir. Yes, sorry. ma'am. <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, no. Thank you. Thank you to you and all those who are um, veterans here today. I appreciate your talk. Um, I'm originally from California, and I grew up in the shadow of La Morne Naval Air, Air Station, which sent out a lot of ships, um, aircraft carriers, to Vietnam. Um, you mentioned very briefly, or maybe it was Dr. Brown that mentioned very briefly, the amount of POWs that still, um, MIAs that still remain yeah. in, in Vietnam. Um, when I say that, I, when I say I grew up in the shadow of a POW MIA flag, I did. It wasn't my own family member. It was actually my um, civil, um, civil studies and social studies uh, teacher in eighth grade whose husband, um, Lieutenant Commander Dennis S. Pike, who was lost uh, March 23rd, 1972, um, over the LZ in Laos. Mm -hmm. And um, my uncle was also on the kitty. Um, the Kitty Hawk, and he, they saw him punch out, but they weren't able to recover him. Yeah, that's one of the, yeah, one of the tragedies of the war. I'm not a Kissinger fan because uh, Kissinger was so much in a hurry to get out that he, he could have uh, made a tougher bargaining for us to leave to have the North Vietnamese do a lot more for our missing uh, prisoners of war and in our MIAs. We know for a fact that after we left and the, the so-called treaty was signed, there were Americans still living in North Vietnam that were helping. Will we prisoners. see with the advances of like DNA and yeah. different, will we see more of our troops come home? I think so, and, and um, we had to kind of the DNA, we had that down, it's a really uh, exact science. The problem was for the first 10 years after the war, uh, the North Vietnamese government, the Congress, they didn't want us over there. Now, as I said earlier, that's become more uh, liberal and, and more capitalist oriented, so the, the cooperation has, has significantly increased. Still a laborious process, yeah. and some of those, unfortunately, we're never gonna see. With the, the, the one thing that I will always carry with me from learning from her and, and all of her trips to Washington, D.C., um, she helped, she was one of the wives that helped with the Vietnam uh, memorials and a POW MIA memorial was all the redacted paperwork from our government. Yeah. I mean, she literally showed one paper and she held it up and it had his name, his social security number, and then the entire page was just black. It was just redacted, 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 redacted. She's like, how am I gonna get any information yeah. that I already don't know? I know his name, I know his social security number. Yeah, you know? and yeah it they was were, just, it was so had, hard. It was so we hard. had a big thing about secrets and everything else and, and uh, especially some of those folks were over where they weren't supposed to be but we we were there anyway so yeah it's a tra another tragedy any more comments yes sir i have mm -hmm. a question sir um who implemented the training for the uh friendly forces the south vietnamese militias while you were there was it uh Song v or no each battalion uh, would do their own training it was very basic stuff uh we would go into the delta company of our battalion was tasked for that and they would go in, and uh, the soldiers would show them how to shoot properly, shoot the M16 and M60 machine gun, and those kinds of things. Yes. Um, you probably answered this already, but why did you say you didn't win the war? Well, we we lost the war politically. Uh, we lost the war politically uh, because we didn't have the uh, you know the the exact victory that we wanted. Uh, we never lost a battle, but we went out without any, you know, uh, victory in hand. And as we know, the South Vietnamese government collapsed. And that's part of the problem and part of the tragedy of the war. We propped the South Vietnamese up so long because we did a lot of the heavy fighting. And then when we left, they got used to our artillery support, our air support. We kind of left them in a vacuum. And it was too much, too quick. I, for the students, if some of you are taking notes, uh, I want to do this. If you have a piece of paper or something like that, uh, if you want, if you want what I just read to you, uh, with all the detail and everything else, give me an email and I'll send it to you. Uh, so it's Dave. 
dot Taylor, T A Y L O R, Dave dot Taylor at one word here, Zoom Internet dot net. Dave dot Taylor at Zoom Internet dot net. And uh, I'm from Medina, Ohio. I'll be I'll be back tonight. And uh, if you send me that email, said I'd like to have your your uh, narrative for this, I'll be happy to send it to you. Is that all lowercase? Excuse me. Is that all lowercase? Yes, all lowercase. Yep. Okay. Yes, sir. How bad were things when you first sent in troops in that in, in numbers? How bad was the, how bad was things for? <coughs> U.S. soldiers when we first came in and uh, It was getting tough, particularly for the Marines, because the North Vietnamese uh, would come down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and the fastest track was just to go into that I Corps area, and that's where the Marines were in charge of. They had two divisions there, and they they fell in so many North Vietnamese communists that the General Giap, who was the head of the North Vietnamese Army. Laugh with Lee one time. He says, "I got the Marines tied up tighter than a bowstring," and that's why they activated our division, the Americal Division, because the Marines were getting just overworked, and so they moved the two Marine divisions further up the First Corps area, and we took the southern part of the First Corps area. Okay, we'll do. Uh, one or, let me let me get the students in the back row. Yes, sir, go ahead. find yourself um, able to put into words what your situations were um, while others are not so able. Yeah, I think for some, myself, uh, it's a catharsis to, to talk about it. I am the World War II historian for our Army Division Association. And try as I might for many, many years, I've been the World War II historian since 2000, you cannot get those people to open up. A part of it is generational. Uh, there are so many people in World War II that it's like, I don't want to stand out. I didn't know more than somebody else. And they didn't want to get them all together. They'll talk to the cows come home, but not one-on-one. -on -one. Last comment right here. I don't, I don't want to put you on the spot. Sure. I think for the students' sake, there should be some mention of the role that public opinion played in the winning or losing of this war. Yeah. And how most of us came home and why. Yeah, I told Dr. Brown uh, before the thing, I, in q and A, I I can do it, but we're running out of time, but I'll, I can talk about the geopolitical aspects of the war uh, in q and I don't like to do that uh, during the presentation because everybody's got an opinion and we'll be arguing about that for the next 50 years. Uh, but uh, it, I'll tell you this, and the common thing is Ho Chi, Ho Chi Minh loved the American Constitution, and if we would have just sided with baloney, he was taken at age 16 to Moscow. He was a hardcore Marxist, and uh, he only used that little phrase with members of the OSS in, at the end of World War II. They were the forerunners of the CIA. Uh, when they came over to see what Ho needed to fight the Japanese in the northern part of Vietnam, and that's when he says, oh, I love the American Constitution. I studied it. That was just to get, get the people in, okay, to get the, the aid. And it, he did get some aid, but what did he do with it? He didn't fight the Japanese. He buried the aid to get ready for the war after the, to push the French out. And so we could talk on and on about that. And um, uh, and, and I'd love to talk about it. And um, also, uh, Lyndon Johnson was one of our accidental presidents because Kennedy was killed. And there's a lot we can talk about that and which way that went. And la one last vignette. Um, Eisenhower, of course, was a military man. And in the late 50s, when um, he saw what was happening in South Vietnam, and he saw that the Ho Chi Minh Trail was being built. And uh, he said, well, this is easy to fix. We'll just put an infantry brigade right in there in Laos, where the, the, the trail was being built. But Laos was a partner at that time. And we'll stop all that from happening. But Kennedy was just uh, elected, and he didn't want to come across as telling Kennedy what to do, so he never gave him that advice. No from so anyway. Okay, we're gonna finish it now. I, I just wanted to yeah. say, I think he's referring to the role of the anti war movement. Oh anti yeah. 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 Your unit as you saw it on the ground in the summer of sixty nine. 
Well, um, I didn't have to deal with the anti-war reception when I came home because I came home via uh, air, aircraft. Uh, I was shot up pretty bad, and so I went to Camp Zominger plan, and then I came back through a hospital aircraft, landed in um, Fort Dix, New Jersey. So I didn't have to deal with what some of you folks had to do with the airports and that kind of thing, or you were told when you got to an Army unit and you're, you know, get your uh, uniforms off and get civilian clothes on when you go home, that kind of thing. I didn't have to deal with that. And that's another tragedy, and as a result of that, as a result of that, the biggest supporters of today's Army that have been in Iraq and Afghanistan to make sure they get appreciation when they come back through the airports and that, are the Vietnam veterans. We're the ones that started that. And uh, the credo for the Vietnam Veterans Association is never again will one generation of veterans abandon another. And so that all comes from the Vietnam veterans. So I know some of you have class. Uh, I'll be over there. I'm not expecting you to buy a book. If you want to buy one, fine. Yes, Joel. Oh, <laughs> she was an army nurse at Fort Dix, New Jersey, and uh, so I met her when I, since I'm from New Jersey, you can probably recognize the Jersey accent a little bit. Uh, so I was sent there for a year to heal my leg, and um, so I met her at a little party, and um, uh, so the army issued me a wife. <laughs> and that was 59 years ago, we're going strong. I right, thank you so much.